feel any lightness, we dive. Fairway set, go straight. Left gate for pressure, that side up the beat. Technology, performance, commitment, passion, emotion, drama. The 52 Super Series has it all. Five European venues, 12 teams, 25 days of racing. It is the best class, I think, uh, uh, in the world. World Championship titles are commonplace. This is a series for the best. From Olympic medalists, to America's Cup victors. From inshore rock stars to offshore heroes, the dockside is awash with talent. We are completely full of people who have uh, been doing this for a long, long time. This is also a series driven by the owners at the helm of their machines. They go head to head with the best. Any mistake you make and this fleet gets punished. And if you're in the wrong spot, uh, the, the rest of the fleet will find a way to get in the right spot and uh, make you pay for it. Twenty seventeen had been the most intense season ever, culminating in a nail biting showdown as the final result went down to the wire. Azura had taken the crown. Three time season winners, Quantum Racing, had been pipped at the post. Both were now back for twenty eighteen. Both had one goal in sight, victory. In a season that would prove to raise the bar even higher. To get there meant taking on new venues, big weather, intense competition, and plenty of stress. I enjoy the pressure, that's why I'm here, and I'm, that's why I still do the Olympics, because uh, if I don't have the pressure, it's, it's hard to get into the boat. But it doesn't stop with the sailors. This is a technology race too. Since the launch of the class in 2005, over 60 TP-52s have been built. Each is designed to fit within a set of class rules that are intended to ensure close competition while still allowing teams to innovate. The success of the rule that limits the basic dimensions of the boat has resulted in a constantly evolving fleet of state-of-the-art Grand Prix monohulls. But this hotbed of high technology has also fueled an arms race within the 52 Super Series fleet. Here, the 2018 season stood out before it had even started. Of the 12 teams at the opening event in Sibenik, Croatia, nine had brand new boats at the dock. Nine highly refined carbon fiber machines costing around 2 million euros a piece. Two teams were also running America's Cup campaigns and had drafted in some of the best brains in the business, along with decorated sailors such as double America's Cup winning skipper, Jimmy Spithill. Add the crews, their boats, and the Super Series reputation for close racing together, and the bottom line was clear. This will be the toughest circuit, I think, I, that I've been involved with. And, you know, I'm embarrassed to admit that I've been at every single 52 event ever held. The racing is incredibly close. One mistake and you're right out the back. It's really easy for the last year's winner to be last place in a race. Everybody's got a chance. Not only the performance of the boat, but the, all the, the teams that you have around you. The Five Regatta 2018 season kicked off with two venues that were new to the series. Both were in Croatia, Sibenik and Zadar. From there, the entire circus then moved to Cascais, Portugal for the World Championships. Then Puerto Portales in Mallorca, before heading to the final showdown in Valencia, Spain. As teams prepared to get the 2018 season underway in Sibenik, many were mindful of the needle match finish to the previous season where the overall victory had gone down to the wire. On the final day, four boats could have taken the title. But it was Azura that took the crown. 
beating Harm Muller Spreer's Platoon and Doug DeVos's Quantum Racing to the silverware. And while none in the fleet bear grudges, it was clear that some felt that there was unfinished business at stake. Losing sucks. Never stops hurting. No, never stops hurting. So the moment it stops hurting, I should retire. So who were the teams in the 2018 season? Ending on a high, Azura were keen to carry their winning momentum into 2018. They were first to launch a new boat, and then won the pre-season event in Parma. They had a new tactician, Olympic gold medalist Santiago Langer, after Vasco Vascotto had moved to Luna Rossa. On the face of it, potentially unsettling, although in reality they had swapped one genius for another. But they were taking nothing for granted. You need to keep improving. You know, if, if we don't improve every day on our speed, for sure some other teams will do, and then at the end of the season we will have a problem. Harm Muller Spreer's platoon had won the tiebreak against Doug DeVos's Quantum Racing in 2017. Both were out to get the upper hand this season, and both had new boats, but from different designers. Others that had built new boats for 2018 included Hasso Plattner with Phoenix. He would share the helm through the season with his daughter, Tina. While three-time 52 Super Series winner, Ed Baird, would take responsibility for tactics. You know, hasso has been involved for a, a lot of years in maxi boats and far 40s and 505s. And, um, but this is his first time into, you know, such tight racing like this. And, uh, you know, he's having a lot of fun. Double Olympian Eduardo de Souza was returning to the circuit with his new boat and designed Onda after a three year break. The Brazilian owner had some serious talent among his team, with five time Olympic medalist Robert Scheidt calling the shots. We're a new team, uh, we, we're learning every day, and we, I, I told the guys in the morning that we shouldn't get too excited about it, we should just stick to our job and uh, do the best we could. The third of the new campaigns was Italian America's Cup team, Luna Rossa. Although bristling with talent, they were last to launch their new boat and were just in time for the opening event of the series. And with time against them, even some of the most decorated and experienced members of the team felt like they were playing catch-up. It's a different discipline. It can be just as challenging, for sure, but it's taking me a little while to get my head around it, you know, just, just in terms of where you're looking for the puffs and, and how long it takes for something to arrive, how long it takes to get somewhere but certainly you have a lot of time to talk about stuff, that's for sure. When the talking stopped and the racing began, it was clear that no one could take anything for granted. As if setting the scene for the rest of the week, the first day's racing saw two teams share the top spot as Platoon and Quantum each scored a first and a fourth. Day two saw another team muscle onto the podium as Sled took a comfortable win in the coastal race. Takashi Okura's Sled was another of the new boat in designs to hit the water for 2018. Among the long list of talent in the team, America's Cup winner Ray Davies was in charge of tactics. He was joined by Adam Bischel as strategist, along with Tony Ray and Don Cowie to underline the strong Kiwi influence. Any one of I reckon eight teams could win this year. It's really seriously that close. In the past, there's probably only ever three teams. Andy Soriano launched his boat and designed Allegre, built from the same mould as Quantum Racing. 2017 had been a difficult season for the British flag team, especially after losing their mast in Porto Cervo, Sardinia. This season was about righting the wrongs. A win at Puerto Portales and a fourth place overall at the end of the 2017 season were high points for the crew of Ergin Imeray's Provetsa. Buoyed by their success, Imeray commissioned a new boat for 2018, one of the two new designs from Rolf Rolick. But launching a new boat was no guarantee of a front row seat, and all the teams knew it. Thinking anybody coming into this first regatta with a new boat, you know, it's having to work very hard uh, to understand it, get all the systems working, get the boat going and understand the boat speed. Really hard to get all those systems and to bring all those bits of equipment together and make them work suddenly in a race environment. You know, we could all do with two more weeks. Three teams were using boats from previous seasons. Tony Langley's Gladiator was built in 2017, but seriously damaged in its maiden race during the Miami event last year. 
Jean-Luc Petit-Tuganan's Paprec Resilage was the former RAN Racing from 2015. His team was formed largely of young amateur sailors, but also had top laser sailor Jean-Baptiste Bernaz as his tactician. Giuseppe Parodi completed the 2018 lineup with Chio Huracan, formerly the 2013 and 2014 championship winning Quantum Racing. It was the latest Quantum machine that was now at the front of the fleet on day three as the team won the first of two races. But then, just as the scoreboard started to show form, Paprec bucked the trend. The French team's solid win in the second race of the day proved how a largely amateur crew could still beat the big guns. It's fantastic for the team after our second place yesterday and uh, after this very bad result we had in the first race uh, today it was um, very important for the, the whole team to, to get concentrated again on, the, on our target and, uh, and to have a, a good result. But the amateur's victory was short-lived. Day four saw Quantum take the first win. Provetza took the second. The final day's racing proved how tough it was to maintain a winning streak. Here, Quantum finished seventh, enough to take the overall win, but their path to victory had not been easy. Down the first run, we lost a lot of distance in boat positioning, and that, you know, that's disappointing because you've got to sail with confidence. You know, the guys did such great work all week long, really being critical, but it's good to win. <laughs> Five teams had taken wins in the eight races. Even with points now on the board, writing the form guide was going to be harder than ever. For Quantum Racing, success at the opening event had delivered the first key step in a detailed campaign plan. But whether it's the first or the last regatta of the season, the team's strategy starts with an analytical approach. Stay with us for part two to find out how when we go behind the scenes at Quantum Racing. The opening event of the 2018 52 Super Series had seen Quantum Racing take a first step toward their season's goal. But success in Sibenik hadn't been easy. I think we should end the season right now. We could celebrate, I can go home, but uh, no, it's uh, a lot of guys have put a lot of work in. And when you look at the talent from top to bottom here, it's pretty daunting. This is just risk management. And in order to take a risk management position, you better be fast. Being fast means being smart. Success is no accident for quantum racing, as the team takes a forensic approach to its campaign. Whether training or racing, Every day starts with the same in-depth debrief and a candid discussion. What we're trying to do is get a condensed snapshot of yesterday, uh, the racing or the training, try and make some conclusions, whether that's on which way was the best way to go on the race course, what the conditions were, and then we move on to the speed aspect. So how were the sails trimmed? What shape did the sails have? What shape did the mass have? And was that right for the conditions? The level of detail is impressive. On the mast, when we're taking a picture from behind, we can measure that into two or three millimeters. At this level, two or three millimeter difference in, uh, in mass bend can make a significant difference in speed. Perhaps more surprising is that they don't keep this data to themselves. We debrief as a uh, group of three boats, uh, Quantum Racing, uh, Onda and Platoon and uh, they're all part of the uh, Quantum Sales Group. We do a performance debrief every morning. We're totally open. You know, as you saw this morning, we're not keeping data back. And because of that, it's just uh, the rate of learning is fast. On the water, the process starts with assessing the conditions. What you'll have heard is this constant dialogue between the afterguard on the boat uh, me on the, uh, on the chase boat talking about wind direction, talking about features, clouds, just trying to generally paint the picture to each other. But once the team has started, they're on their own. In many teams, the owners are at the centre of their campaigns, helming their own boats. Ashore, they lead busy lives in the business world. 
they have far fewer hours on the water than the professional crews they face. But no one cuts them any slack on the race course. The Quantum Camp is no different. It takes a unique breed to do this. You've got to be pretty self-confident and have a lot of belief in your process and the people around you. Uh, you can look pretty silly out here pretty quickly. The toughest thing, I think, is getting the time to devote, you know, put the, t the energy and time into actually getting proficient at it. Uh, and I think, you know, gaining the respect, it goes both ways, gaining the respect of the team that they want to battle and provide you everything you need to be successful. Sibenik had been a rude awakening for several of the top teams. Big budgets, stellar crew lists and sophisticated new boats were no guarantee of success. Defending champions and pre-season victors Azura had finished fourth, but had made several visits towards the back of the fleet in the process. Luna Rossa had also struggled to get their brand new boat up to speed. So when you are behind, you need to, to try to recover as much as you can. I think that we did a, a good job. We are not fantastic, but yeah, we are in a, good, uh, in a good spot. We have a new team, a new boat uh, and everything. But uh, we are not so far, so I'm quite positive on that. Just four weeks later, the fleet was back on another brand new race course, 40 miles along the Croatian coast in Zadar. The break between regattas had allowed those with new boats to play catch up. Every team was now capable of taking a win. We feel it's a one design class now. All of the boats are so similar that it's whoever does the, um, the basics well, you know, good start and keeping out of trouble. And as the first race of the second Croatian event got underway, keeping out of trouble was a popular strategy among the teams, as the leaderboard took another shuffle. Luna Rossa came off the start line in fighting mood, delivering a perfectly executed pin end start. And while it was Provetsa that rounded the first mark in pole position, they dropped back through the fleet as they struggled with technical problems at the bottom of the first lap. Having now taken the lead, the Italians had a clean run around the rest of the course to take their first win. Andy Soriano's Allegre took second. Meanwhile, Quantum Racing fell from grace with a ninth. In the second race, Luna Rossa delivered another perfect pin end start but were pipped at the top mark by Gladiator, who squeaked through to take a narrow lead. A lead that Tony Langley's team never gave back. With a first and second on the opening day, Team Lunarossa dared to hope that their campaign had at last turned a corner. Yet deep down, everyone knew that the odds of more big shuffles on the scoreboard were high. Day two was a perfect example, as a newcomer to the class took the first win of the day. Tina Plattner, helming Phoenix, turned heads with an impressive performance. She was also the first helmswoman to win a TP52 race. I think everyone is really upbeat and excited. For me, it's going a lot better than I expected it coming here. So I think we're taking it a day at a time. It's also with all the shifts out there, it, it makes it a bit easier, even if you're not right up there from the word go. In the following race of the day, SLED took the coastal race once again having won this race in Sibenik a month earlier. There was one team that were playing it cool, as Platoon delivered a consistent performance, taking a second in both races. But some of the former top dogs were finding life tough, as Quantum and Azura failed to find the form that has frequently made them the favourites. For Quantum, it had been a bittersweet day. It was disappointing to hit Platoon at the top mark and break our prod off. Um, but at that moment, if you'd said we were going to pass four boats in the race, I probably would have said, you're crazy, and we did. With four scores now on the board, it was clear that the performance of the boats across the fleet had narrowed. Yet the original intention of those that had built new boats for the 2018 season was to engineer a performance advantage. Together, they'd spent around 20 million euros to do so. So what had been behind the new designs and what were teams seeking to achieve? 
basically we have a complete new generation of boats here because so many owners decided that they want to have a new one. So I think this is uh, quite unique and of course every generation has some improvements and uh, the emphasis on, on let's say the first upwind legs and, and the marks have been so tense now that they just have to let's say concentrate on that part. And the biggest gains that the class has made is on, on the way the balances works on, on these kind of boats. So they really now are let's say set up, they just want to go upwind, they don't want to go anywhere else. <laughs> The balance of these boats, the biggest improvements, or well, improvements, part of it, of course, foils, how foils twist and also position of foils uh, refer in, in reference basically to the sail plan. So they're sailing with much bigger angles, rudder angles and all kinds of stuff like that. So that when we make improvements from generation to generation, we still call it like seconds per mile. That means basically we call it like a, a good improvement if we talk about two seconds per mile. That means four seconds on, on a beat, which is less than a boat legs. And that's what we are looking for, that's what we're trying to find. Of course, the combination of improvements of sails and rigging and all the other stuff makes the differences probably bigger. But it wasn't just below the waterline that had seen tweaks and developments in the new designs. I think uh, one, of the, one of the main upgrades from uh, the 2017 design into this one, uh, first you see in the cockpit, you've got a bit more flair on the, on the cockpit sides, which makes the cockpit actually uh, much wider uh, than if you look back at certainly Gladiator, which this is the same, same design boat as. Uh, the big standout thing for Azura is their, their jib tack trough right at the, right at the front, um, creating better airflow over the, over the jib. Um, I think it's something that the next generation of boats that are built, will, will, a lot of them will have that. It's the only boat in the fleet that has it. And I think a lot of people probably looked at it when it first came out and were quite jealous they had it. And uh, it will be a feature in the future for sure. Thunderstorms prevented any racing on day three, but by the time the fleet were back out on the race course, the pack was being shuffled once again. Race 5 was a British battle from start to finish as Tony Langley's Gladiator locked horns with Andy Soriano's Allegre. Although Gladiator had led for the majority of the race, she was overtaken at the last windward mark as Allegre took the lead and the win at the bottom of the final downwind leg. Quantum took third. The second race of the day was marked by another win for Tina Plattner and her crew aboard Phoenix. As teams digested the new scores and considered their strategies for the final races of the event, what they didn't know at the time was that windless conditions for the final day would make the penultimate day's racing decisive in Zada. Platner's team had thrust itself to the top of the leaderboard. Overall victory was in sight. But a last place in the penultimate race dropped them from the top spot with one race to go before bouncing back with a third in the final race to finish second overall. Yet Platner was still upbeat. Definitely way beyond expectations. It's been good, it's been good fun. It's a really awesome fleet to sail in. We try to really start every race from scratch again, say, you know what, it doesn't matter where we came in the last race. This is a new start and let's go and try our best again. So it's, it's been an awesome experience. Although they'd only scored one win throughout the regatta, Luna Rossa had spent most of the week in the leading group. Maintaining a consistent performance was sufficient to turn their fortunes around to take the overall win. I'm a lucky guy. I mean, I have uh, uh, Bruni as a driver, I have uh, James Pitil as a strategist. So uh, I have a Pietro Sibello on the main ship. I mean, I'm a lucky guy. I'm very lucky to have uh, uh, this kind of guys so close to me. They help me a lot uh, to take the decision. Zadar had seen Luna Rossa take the crown. Phoenix had shot to fame. And Sled had now delivered two podium finishes. But while Quantum considered what had gone wrong in Zadar, they were still leading overall, just. From here, the fleet faced a big step change. From the Adriatic to the Atlantic, the next venue in Cascais, Portugal, and its reputation for punchy conditions promised to put greater demands on the crews. 
it's still that cliche, just trying to take it one regatta at a time and one day at a time, but uh, we know we move into quite different venues. Cast guys can throw uh, a lot more breeze and a lot more waves at you, so that's going to be a whole new game for us there. It was nice to have uh, the last two days here with a bit more breeze than we'd had most of the season so far, so we uh, came away hoping to get some stuff in 14 knots, and we have, and we're pleasantly surprised with where we're at, but uh, throw the waves in it and it'll all become a little bit different again. As it turned out, the understatement of the season. Cash Kai's would deliver all this and plenty more. Stay with us to see why. Cash Kai's. This small, picturesque Portuguese seaside town comes with a big reputation. Wind, waves, and wild weather. There is no middle ground. Turn right out of the harbour, and it's straight into the Atlantic. And the sailors love it. It was incredible conditions out there. It's just windy, and the boats, you know, loaded up, and the downwind, we were going, I think we hit 22 or 23 knots today, and it's just really, really fun. Take the power, sophistication, and complexity of a modern TP-52, race it on a course that has the potential to break it. And when the weather is dialed up to 10, cash cars can be one of the toughest gigs on the inshore circuit. The tables had turned in Zadar. Luna Rossa had found their form after a difficult start to the season. Phoenix and Sled had found race-winning pace too, as both took spots on the podium alongside the Italians. In the music business, they say making the second hit album is much harder than the first. It certainly seemed that way for Doug DeVos's team. Victors in the opening event, fifth in the second. Quantum Racing had had a tough ride, but while they were disappointed, they were not dispirited. They were still top of the charts in the overall stakes with a four-point advantage over Sled, but there was a long way to go. And they knew that Cash Guys had the potential to shake things up once again. There was pressure aplenty, yet the defending world champion took a different approach. What we achieved last year was a great uh, achievement and we're not, uh, it's like a normal regatta, otherwise you, if you're feeling nervous and make yourself nervous finally, then you have no chance to win. Nerves or not, the boisterous conditions raised the stakes from the word go, as strong winds and big seas added to the fierce competition in this closely packed fleet. And as teams let their beasts off the leash downwind, the result was a full-on foam up for the fleet. This is what everyone had been waiting for. Some were finding the fresh conditions especially challenging. Hot foot from their success in Zada, Luna Rossa saw a change in fortune on the opening day with gear failure forcing them to retire from the first race. Others were bouncing back as last season's rock stars Azura found their form after a slow start in Croatia. Quantum Racing had also hit the ground running in Portugal. Reveling in the strong breeze, they took a second and a first on the opening day. It was the start they were looking for. That was champagne cask ice conditions. And uh, I would suspect that's exactly when the fleet and the series committed to coming here. That's why we came. So just an awesome day of yachting. And it was a great way to start the regatta. You know, Azura had a great day as well. They sailed really, really well. And so, yeah. Can't complain. But Azura had also taken a first and a second. They were relieved to have found their previous season winning performance. The guys did a really good job sailing the boat very well. We didn't do any mistakes as we have done in the in Sadar for sure. And so I think when we put all together, then the, for sure the level of the team is good enough to be up there. Looks easy, but diving at the top mark is a risky maneuver and you have to keep it all together. So. It's not all about tactics, it's about sailing the boat really well in these conditions. The punchy conditions in Cash Kai's had made getting around the corners of the course even tougher. Good crew work and reliable boats were key. You know, it's balancing the risk of racing hard versus the, the you know, risk of racing hard and maneuvers that you have to do. And, you know, we were pretty aggressive in the first race down the first run, jibing. And on the second run of the first race as well, you know, doing a lot of boat handling and with that comes risk. You know, that last race we jibed and 
when the spinnaker popped, we flew the spinnaker chute off the over the prod, and so we basically, fortunately, we were on ley line and uh, didn't have any more jibes into the finish, but it's stuff like that, you know, so you, you aggressively boat handle, but it's blowing 30 knots of breeze, and it always has the potential to go bad. With the conditions putting more pressure on crew work, so the focus started to shift to the technical details of the machines themselves. So what makes a modern TP-52 tick? Prevetz's boat captain, Joe Lees, provided a tour and highlighted just a few of the details and design refinements aboard the current generation of TP-52s. Well, here we are on board uh, Team Prevetza. As you, as you see, all the boats are a 52-foot long boat, and they're all very much in a box rule. Um, but every boat has its subtle differences, and this is what's developed over the last sort of 15 years, really, of this formula-style class boat. Downwind over the waves, everybody's standing really far back on the boat, so we actually have positions far back in the boat. And this is a thought process which has come about over the last few years, once again, pushing the limits to the absolute max. So you'll see the guys all standing at the back of the boat, everybody using their foot chocks here to actually brace themselves in position, everybody's high up on this side. What we have further back in the boat is you've always got a grinding system at the back of the boat. So once again, very much the development of how we're moving things backwards in the boat, keeping weight aft. Obviously, all this system super lightweight. So up on the rig, we've got the running backstays. They have deflector strings on them, which are controlled by hydraulics. And these are the little control lines which control those. What you'll see on board the boat are lots of uh, orange dots. Now the orange dots aren't a part of the design for how the boat looks. It's actually a very crucial part of how we trim the sails. What we utilize is the same color orange bands on the sails and then the same color orange on the deck. We have a camera at the top of the mast which then uses these as the datum point and then sees where the sails are at any point. And that gives the sail designers a lot of helpful information about how to create the best shape for sailing purposes. What we've developed within this class and in many others is a lightweight ceramic coated winch. These are called air winches and there's not a lot going on inside the winch other than purely the control cogs and uh, the ceramic drum. So this is a development which is happening right now and making stuff a lot lighter and stronger and that's the beauty of a series like this. The development in the rigging has gone to carbon fibre and you get a lot lower profile and that even goes right down to the terminations of the deck level. So previously you used to have a, like a rigging screw or a deck screw which used to be quite big stainless steel up through the deck. What we've done now is we've terminated with the carbon right down to the deck which reduces the windage dramatically. So as we open the hatch here you'll see some interesting developments. Most notably you'll see is a big curved area and a big curve through the hatch. That's when we drop the spinnaker. The spinnaker itself goes flying through here and we use what's called a drop line system, which is a rope from the back of the boat, goes all the way up into the sail. When you drop the sail, it pulls the whole spinnaker straight through this, all the way to the back of the boat in up to four seconds. So that's a really, really quick drop. So you can imagine that all this area here is, is really smooth. There's nothing that's going to snag on this area. This is a huge advantage at the bottom mark to get that spinnaker away and going upwind really, really quickly. The other thing you'll notice is this blue area around the sides. This is what we call the hatch seal. So when the hatch is closed, like that, it actually pumps up and seals to stop that water. You'll see, you know, the racing here in Cash Guys is very wet and there's a lot of water over the foredeck. Once that's pumped up, very little water goes down below. But while Lees was happy to show us around on deck, there are some areas aboard a modern 52 that are completely off limits. Heading below decks was not an option. Back on the race course, Luna Rossa bounced back from their gear problems on the opening day to take a win in the first race on day two. Azura continued their performance at the front of the fleet with a second. Quantum Racing took a third. Was a pattern starting to appear? The results in race four suggested not, as Quantum slipped to fourth, Azura plummeted to seventh, and Allegri took the win. But in the races that followed, the big guns bounced back as Quantum and Azura held on to the top two spots in their private duel. 
With the end in sight, the pressure increased. Azura had won the penultimate race with Quantum finishing fifth. And while Quantum still led overall, it was by just three points. To win the Worlds, Azura had to repeat this performance in the final race and beat Quantum by more than two places. Victory was in sight and a battle in store. So Nick, a pretty solid start from uh, Quantum on that pin end. Managed to push uh, Azura back into the mix. Uh, Quantum now in a very strong position out in this left side. Taking the left-hand side of the first beat in the hope that the breeze would swing left, Quantum had the potential to take early control of the race. The plan worked and they led at the first weather mark. It could not be closer. The fantastic shot there of Quantum smoking off downwind, Azura giving chase. Azura was in hot pursuit, but following would never get them past. They needed to try something different. And Azura jiving. Yeah, Azura's going to have to do something special here to get Quantum back in the fleet. I mean, not only do they need to be ahead of them, they need boats, they need boats in between. So, By the bottom gate, the move hadn't delivered what they'd hoped, but they hadn't lost out either. There was another lap to go. Azura is going to have to stay close to the Quantum here and try to make something happen. Quantum kept her pace and position, but the upwind leg was not good for Azura. By the top mark, they dropped a place as a leg race slipped through. Time was running out for the Italians. One last big push saw them overtake Allegri to regain their second place. But they couldn't catch Quantum, let alone place two boats in between them. As Terry Hutchinson's team crossed the line to take the World Championship title, the relief was clear. Dean and Warwick and Daggy had the boat just on fire, and so, you know, that's, you know, it, it's just so awesome to see that teamwork play out and those guys sail the boat as well as they did because the rest of us were looking at our toes. <laughs> You're only as good as your last race, and uh, fortunately for us right now, that was a win. This isn't an individual win, this is a full team win. The step on from last season is quite impressive to see with the teams. Quantum sailed really well, so congratulations to them. And uh, it was a really, really nice venue. It's an excellent regatta for sure. Uh, I really wanted to win, uh, but didn't happen. It was close racing, and that's always fun, you know. And uh, uh, we take away a lot of learnings, and uh, we need to keep improving. There were no mixed emotions in the third spot, though, as Allegre took their first podium of the season. This was uh, one of the best regattas we've done, I think, up to date. To, to, so, yeah, we, we, we're very pleased and, and super, super happy. Kashkais had delivered. A new world champion had been crowned, and they'd moved 19 points ahead in the overall Super Series standings. Were they now on the home straight? It's been a difficult season so far. I mean, we're we're leading the series, but you wouldn't think so in our camp. You know, everybody we need, we feel we need to be better, make better decisions, uh, go a little bit faster, and you know, we're just working hard just to get better every single day. Stay with us in part four to find out how the final results played out. Puerto Portales, Mallorca. The penultimate event of the season and the pressure was building, not least for the series leaders. Uh, you feel pressure all the time <laughs> in this circuit um, and, and in this venue because it is so unpredictable. It, it, you know, the wind comes in and how it comes in is, is not always consistent. You know, little puffs mean a lot uh, you know, of difference on the race course. In short, luck would play a part. Whoever wins this event and whoever wins any of these events has gotten just a bit of good fortune their way along with doing the fundamentals correctly. So. You know, we're trying to just stay true to the processes that we have about getting off the line, sailing fast, being smart, not, you know, shrimping a spinnaker and doing those sorts of things and that have plagued us this season. And, uh, you know, we'll put it together and, and if it's our event again, it's our event. But, uh, we know, at this point, if we can just put in a, a good result relative to this season, we're going to be happy. The first hurdle came when the breeze refused to arrive. When racing did get underway on day two, few were using the luck word Yet it was clear that anyone could go from boom to bust in a heartbeat. Platoon provided the evidence taking first blood in the opening race, only to come last in the second. Provetza and Azura also won races, but also scored results in the bottom half of the fleet too. 
the Grand Prix roller coaster had started once again. After five races, five different teams had taken wins. Consistency was as hard to get hold of as a bar of soap in the bath. You want to sail good, and if you don't sail good, you feel upset or you feel the pressure to change it around. So more for me, it's more the pressure about sailing well and the, the challenge to sail well the boat, and uh, that pressure is always there, no matter what you do. The secret is to try to keep the highs from getting too high and the lows from getting too low. You know, I, I know it's a cliche, but it's true, and that's, that's the way to get through these hot regattas. Meanwhile, the unstable and changeable conditions continued to mix up the results. Avoiding a bad result, rather than setting hearts on a win, was the strategy adopted by most of the teams. Here, it was Quantum that were performing best. Yet the final race took the overall result down to the wire. DeVos' team kicked off with a six-point advantage over Azura, who in turn were on even points with Platoon. Behind them, Phoenix were just two points adrift. Given the turbulent nature of the results so far, the event was still anybody's game. And the final results proved it as Azura took the win, followed by Platoon and Phoenix. Both finished on the podium. Yeah, it's been a really tough regatta for us. Um, we've been really comfortable with our speed all week. I think we're probably the fastest boat out there, but uh, we've got ourselves in some situations. We've got three penalties, which cost us quite a few points. Uh, at the end of the day, so, you know, but we're, we're happy to be on the podium, obviously. Quantum was fourth in the final race, but their points buffer had kept them on top to take the event win by just three points. What a regatta, huh? right till the very last race to the very last leg. You, you never know who was going to win, so uh, it was spectacular. The guys, uh, the whole team was just was wonderful. The competitors were fabulous, and so to win was really satisfying. In the overall stakes, their lead had opened up. Quantum were now ahead by 32 points, but they still refuse to take anything for granted. No lead is safe. Everyone is still working on it, focusing on it, so we're going to have it uh, full on, I'm sure, right to the end. Sustainability is a hot topic for the 52 Super Series. Aside from the serious effort that every team makes in improving its green credentials, the event organizers and crews work with local communities at each of the venues to help spread the word. From beach cleans to education programs. Throughout the season, the campaign has taken several forms and built awareness of the need to take action. And while teams regularly help with cleanup operations, local children are also an important part of the project that helps to drive home the choices that we all make. It's great to have all these kids down here uh, doing the cleanup, but in reality, this stuff shouldn't even be here. So, uh, you know, it's about reducing, uh, you know, your, your plastic use every day from simple things as having a reusable water bottle, uh, you know, plastic cups in the morning, uh, styrofoam containers for lunch, you know, all that stuff should be eliminated. In my personal life, I always carry a water bottle and always refill it. Uh, try to cut out as much plastic as I can. You go to a golf course and you, you get some water and you, you see them using styrofoam cups, plastic straws, plastic lids, and you know, you, you really got to make an effort, and not just here at these regattas, but when you go home and, and you know, you say something to people and say, hey, look, it'd be really simple change to, instead of going styrofoam, go paper, something that, that breaks down and biodegrades, and if everyone does that, has that same attitude, I think uh, it'll go a long way in the future. Kerry, our team logistics manager and I, we're quite keen on doing things for the environment. And Kerry has worked for a company that does sustainable products and stuff. So she's quite big on making sure we have glass bottles and our rubbish gets separated. And she's like going to other teams and telling them how they should or shouldn't be doing. We want to do our part out there. It's important. We need to keep the oceans and the environment clean. We need to keep the air clean. So we're definitely trying to do our bit too. We know more about the cosmos than we do about the ocean. So I think for the future generations, as a surfer myself, it's, it's sad, it's sad to see. So I think more care and responsibility for the life and the planet that we live in. As teams prepared for the final showdown in Valencia, Quantum led the charge. Having stretched out a 32-point lead over second-placed Azura, the team had a comfortable buffer, even if they were reluctant to admit it. But what drives a big and successful sailmaker to place its reputation on the line by committing so much time, money and resource into racing in the hottest monohull fleet in the world? 
At the beginning of the season, Quantum Sales president Ed Reynolds had a clear view. You know, it's uh, sort of like the motor car racing, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. I mean, it brings recognition to the company. We use it for product development, our IQ program, which is the design software we use to design all the sales. This validates everything we do. And, uh, you know, it's uh, there used to be a big ad with one of our competitors, the virtual wind tunnel. Well, this is the virtual wind tunnel, and this is where we develop and find out what works and what doesn't work. By the end of a busy season, in which Quantum Racing had worked closely with other teams throughout the series, he explains some of the key reasons why they are involved. Everybody in the company is so tuned in, so excited about it, so proud. Uh, you know, that impact, it obviously has raised our profile and, you know, we've proved to the world we, we have the capabilities to compete on any level with any other supplier in the industry. But the internal impact is the one that really strikes me of how important it is to our team. People need to know how to measure, how to get better. People want to be better at this sport. And, you know, it's very difficult. There's, unless you're at this level and you have the resources to hire some of these top pros, that type of information isn't shared throughout the different stratus of sailing. As the fleet arrived in Valencia, picking a favourite looked easy. At each of the four previous events, only two teams had won. Quantum had taken three victories, Luna Rossa won. The odds for the season's ultimate victor were surely set. Yet the intensity of the racing and the number of teams that had been on the podium throughout the season painted a different picture. Of the 11 on the circuit, six had shared the champagne showers. On the other hand, Quantum Racing had never won a race at the two previous events in Valencia. While Azura, who was second in the overall stakes, had cleaned up in the 2012, winning five of the eight races. To skew the odds even further, there was local knowledge aplenty in the fleet, gleaned largely from previous America's Cup cycles. Among the long list of former Valencia residents, SLED's Ray Davies, Team New Zealand's long-term tactician, knew this area like the back of his hand. Luna Rossa's Jimmy Spithill had completed two cup tours here, winning the second aboard Oracle Racing's Giant Try. I actually spent six years in Valencia with the campaign before with Luna Rossa, so it was, yeah, I really enjoyed the culture and the place, and, and it's very, very, uh, you know, challenging sailing on this racetrack. No surprise then that Quantum Racing were taking nothing for granted just keep improving and trying to improve anyway, learning and, and so felt better. You don't think about the stress, but you, it, it's you an amazingly it. stressful thing where you're just like, wow, yeah. you, you know, and that's at every position, everybody's doing that. Quantum racing may have been the favorites, but there were other teams who knew that the event podium and the crown were still within reach. As if to prove that point, it was Harm Muller Spreer's platoon that took the first win while Quantum posted an eighth and Luna Rossa a midfield sixth. The poor showing from the front runners provided the kick start that was required, with Luna Rossa winning the next race and Quantum taking second. In fact, the race favorites had to wait until day four to get their first win. Normal service had been resumed and by the end of the day, they had secured the season victory with a day to spare. Yeah, there was a bit of uh, points counting going in into the, even before the, uh, the final race. So, yeah, the deed is done. We've uh, won the season. So, uh, goals achieved. Win the World Championships and win the season. Everybody's very pleased. I think I just said dip me in cream and lock me in a room full of kittens. This is the day you've been waiting for all season. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we've been waiting for it for about a year's time. But with euphoria came relief. The season had been demanding, and as the emotional release bubbled to the surface unexpectedly, it was clear just how much had been bottled up. When asked to reflect on what this victory meant, their tactician and frontman was stuck for words. I'd say the highlight of the season for sure was the win in Portals. With Doug. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Um, because he's, you know, one sec. Sorry. Um, because, you know, he's stuck. He's, stuck. he's, a, hmm. 
he's our guy. And so <clears throat> to um, win that regatta with him steering, you know, there was no better feeling <clears throat> this year than that. So I can't say enough good things about it. With four boats separated by just three points going into the final day, taking the event win was going to be tough. A fitting finish to a closely fought season. Yet despite this tantalizing finale, the weather refused to play ball, leaving Luna Rossa to take the event victory. We did it. We win the last event, but unfortunately the podium was still some points uh, in front. We know that we lost some points around the course, but this is the life, this is sport, and the nice thing about this circuit that is the best uh, in the world. Win, lose or draw, few could sum up the 52 Super Series better. The 2018 season had seen the standard of racing in an already fiercely competitive fleet increase yet again. Five events, 12 teams, 20 nationalities, 42 races, one winner, their fourth season victory and their sixth world championship title. Quantum Racing had reasserted their authority in the hottest monohull event of them all. After losing their title last year, Doug DeVos's team were back on top and the most successful to date in the 52 Super Series.